uh, topic for this week's uh, Crypto Wednesday. Maybe it's good that we uh, introduce ourselves uh, on behalf of Gorda and myself. First of all, welcome, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, and we would also like to thank Iconic for being the, the host and supplying this event. So we're very, really grateful for Iconic from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. For everybody that doesn't know me yet, my name is Sander de Bruyne. I'm from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I've been around in the crypto blockchain scene already for a couple of years. And together with my, one of my friends, Gordon, we took the initiative to organize Crypto Wednesdays just to share insights and developments in and around the crypto and blockchain markets, just to contribute something back. So uh, for today, we have a really exciting program. We have uh, uh, three really good speakers, and I'm, I'm happy to have uh, Bear and Timothy and Wolf on the on the call. But at first, before we introduce them, I would like to hand over to uh, to Gordon. Gordon, hi. Where are you today? Yeah, so we, we should actually give our locations. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Gordon Einstein uh, from Crypto Law Partners, and I am connecting with you from early dawn Los Angeles. So it, it is 5:35 a.m. here. And I'm excited to join you should, as this progresses, see the sky light up behind me. And we were just talking before the recording started that it's one upside, if you can call it that, of the COVID situation is the ability for, or it's become much more natural and normal for people in different locations at different time zones to connect and share knowledge and share their experiences. And we're happy to be part of that upside, at least. Um, and Sander, happy to be doing this with you again, and very happy to have our esteemed guests join us. I think we uh, hit the ball out of the park, to use an American baseball analogy on this one. So we, we, we set the mark high. And I guess let's proceed. Do you want to yeah, talk maybe, a little bit about the Zoom rules? And then yeah, we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Maybe it's good be, before you do a little intro to our special guest today is uh, for our audience, just, mm -hmm. a, just on regular some general uh, Zoom rules. So we, we have closed all the, uh, the microphones and the cameras just to have optimal sound for you guys to have the best stream. If there are any questions that you would like uh, the, the guest speakers for today, please put your uh, questions in the chat box. Then our moderator, Luke, behind the scenes, he's working really uh, good for us. He can get the right questions out. And if it's appropriate for this call, then we can uh, implement them. We would uh, appreciate your your participants in, in that. And in the meantime, just enjoy the ride. We look forward to uh, getting your feedback and uh, yeah, looking forward to building building the audience because that's also one of our purposes. So Gordon, maybe to you back and if you can introduce our, our guest for today. Sure, happy to. So the, the subject of today's Crypto Wednesday is the Dev DAO project. And we'll, actually the guests will tease out what that means, but it's the Dev DAO project, which is very exciting. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be lightly touching it, I guess you, you could say. And I want to introduce three, I don't know if they have formal titles yet, but let's call them founding board members for the moment, you know, and they can correct or update that as they see fit. Um, they have, I'll, I'll give them the credit of saying we have the initiator of the project and the lead. We have Tim, Timothy Lewis, famous blockchain and platform expert. I'll let him explain more about his background. We have Professor Wolf Kao, uh, who is very well known in this space. Um, happy to have him as a colleague. He has published a great deal of work examining blockchain, ICO securities, uh, hedge fund policy. It, he's done some very interesting work and his most recent work, which is articulated in a Medium article relating to the DevDAO is really groundbreaking. So we're, we're gonna be discussing that. And then Bernd Lapp, um, Bernd, say something, wave your hands, just so I can see there. My, my, my favorite Swiss Zug native, or not native necessarily, resident, I, I should say. Um, Well-known entrepreneur, especially in that area. And I'm, I'm gonna let each individual describe themselves in more detail, but I, I think we have the, the inner inner party, the, the brain trust of the DevDAO, and I'm very happy to have them join us. Mm -hmm. And so the, you know, I'm gonna do a quick rotation. So for our three speakers, we're gonna do a concise self intro. So name, location, just so we know where you are in the world, and just like a sentence about yourself. And we'll go into the longer version, especially as it relates to your involvement in the DevDAO project. But just real quick, Tim, give us a quick uh, one, Tim, quick sure. blow down on you. Sounds good, Gordon. 
Uh, Timothy Lewis, I am calling in from, from Berlin right now. And uh, short sentence, I guess, just decent human. I, I, you know, I saw that in your LinkedIn. <laughs> and, you know, I think, I think, uh, you, know, you know, Google had do no harm or don't be evil, actually. Don't be evil. And they had to take it down. But I see that you held on to decent humans. So your, your track record is better than some, other, some just, others just, out there. Just try to do some good in the world, Gordon. Uh, that's yeah, that's about well, it. You definitely are. Professor. I'm just going to call uh, you Professor the whole show. So please go ahead. Uh, Gordon, you gave me more than an introduction than I need that I needed. Uh, so yeah, I, I've been in it for, what, eight years. I was at Goldman first at Cravath. PhD trade economist, and I got my wake up call um, after reviewing some of the math and what's possible in this space. Mm -hmm. And I got really motivated because I saw the potential, but I also saw all the shortcomings where people haven't delivered on decentralized infrastructure products. And once I understood the power of this, I, you know, I was hooked. So that, that's, that's it. And I've been publishing on it ever since. And I'll also add that I've read through a lot of your papers and you seem to bring a nicely empirical approach to the intersection between technology and law. And I'll go slightly off topic. Is that something you had before deep diving into blockchain and crypto and it transferred over nicely or did one yeah. sort of evoke the other? So before really going into crypto, so, so you have to understand crypto is a is a, is a perfect application of what I've been preaching for decades, basically, which is decent, mm -hmm. sorry, not decent, it's dynamic governance, right? So I got uh, into the governance movement very early in my career, including in the PhD years. And um, there, there's, there's this sense in the community that they, 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 they know governance in centralized system doesn't work and has to be upgraded. But every time we upgrade it, what we do is we just, relabel the old things and call them something different and you know change a little labels mm -hmm. and it's always the old thing and then there's never a dynamic element so i've written on dynamic systems in law for a really long time and i got into this uh, with an article that was actually published by the aba gordon just to underscore what that means right um, for, for, our inter for our international audience American Bar Association. The American Bar Association, which is okay. trying to sort of uphold the centralized mm -hmm. top-down power structure in law for the most part, right? And so I published an article on um, distributed jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Just this idea that, you know, we need something new in law for smart contracting. And every attempt in the academy, everybody that talks about this, all they do is, uh, they try to apply the existing systems to this new technology and it doesn't work. And so that was, you know, that's how, that's how I got started. And I got pretty desperate at times because my colleagues, they all like, oh no, no, we just adjust the law quickly, right? And so, yeah, I've been publishing in this for a long time. Interesting, and we'll dive more into this as, as we proceed because your, your, your framework for, for lack of a better word seems to intersect directly with this project. And the challenges and opportunities posed by this project. Mr. Lapp, I, I, I know you're fantastic. I know you, I, I had trouble summarizing you. So maybe you can do a better job than I did. Oh yeah, well, I tried to. So I've uh, been born and raised in Germany, then moved to Switzerland in 2014. And now am um, living and working in the heart of blockchain as I call it, the Crypto Valley in Zug. Mm -hmm. And I came or come from a very diverse, diverse um, background. I started in professional sports then went to online marketing and now I'm at blockchain and I think uh, this is where I will end. <laughs> so this will be my- it, it sounds very terminal. Let's just say you're gonna be in this for a long time. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Yes. So that's about me. And, and you, we'll get into it, but you've provided invaluable insights and knowledge of some nuances of Swiss law that I think are esoteric and very useful for our audience. And, and we'll dive into that during the conversation. It's, it's been fascinating watching this develop. So Tim, I'm gonna pass it to you. I, I think to understand the DevDAO project, you have to understand DAOs in general, but before we get in, into that, can you give us sort of a very high level executive summary of the project, just so there's an overall context or framework for the following discussion? You know, what is the DevDAO? What, what's its form? What's its mission? Like what's, yeah. what's the spark? Sure. So, so you know, over the last 
nine, 10 years of working in um, decentralized networks. Uh, one of the things that I've recognized or I started to recognize about five years ago after the Ethereum launch is that we were moving away from the value that was placed on uh, engineering and, and developers inside the projects. Uh, more value was being um, given to speculation. Uh, and, and although speculation is a very important aspect in the growth of these networks, there's still so much engineering to be done. And the, um, the you know, early on uh, in 2010, 2011, 2012, and as we got into the secondary, um, into kind of the second layer of, of, of Bitcoin, JR, Witten's uh, paper, and, and then Ethereum, uh, mm -hmm. most of the conversations that you would have with anyone that was participating in the, uh, you know, the, the, the groups about crypto asset networks or crypto, crypto assets at all were developers. And, um, you know, there weren't many people in, you know, that in 2014, 2015, you know, that there's still just a scarce amount of developers that had migrated over to these projects. And after the big boom of Ethereum, uh, the 2016, 2017 period, uh, and the, all of the speculators came in, there wasn't much value uh, left for any of the other networks that were trying to uh, kind of spur up. And you know, a lot of the, the my favorite developers, I've been a developer I, I, for- Actually, I'm sorry, let me interrupt because that, that you, you caught my ear, my interest. Are you, are you saying that like Ethereum and similar projects, projects sort of suck the air out of the room for other projects? Well, and just, and just be direct. <laughs> yeah, well, so, so I, I think I think that the the, the, the got the attention of um, those that were going to just come in and, and utilize the new technology for financial growth and financial gains, whereas the, the technology itself has not had not been and has not been fully developed yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they were uh, because of the way that, that the value is placed on you know assets depending on the type of network. Um, you know, traditionally, those that were working on and those that were a part of building out the systems uh, had a little bit of time to earn value uh, before external uh, sources came in to be able to exchange this value. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and you know, it's a, it's a, it's a being a securities engineer as well as a security engineer. Um, you know, the, the, the old adage of, of startups and where you can actually uh, have liquidity on startups and, and, and that being a multiple year um, process used to allow people that were engineers and a part, part of early startups um, you know, have value uh, for mm -hmm. their efforts in building. Um, I just believe after really Ethereum, Ethereum, because it was so successful, uh, tokenization of, uh, of, of these projects didn't occur really until MasterCoin. Um, this was right. in 2012, 2013. And, uh, you know, after Ethereum, um, you know, it was really well known to many different projects to use this, uh, this method of uh, value capture uh, to, to launch, uh, launch projects. And, you know, as great as that was, and as interesting as that was, you know, I feel that it attracted in some cases, people that weren't as capable to come in and, and build these networks because we have so much work to do on the engineering side. Uh, so the engineers that had been left behind and might not have um, benefited in, in some of the uh, in some of the the, the, the boom pre you know, pre 2015 2016 mm -hmm. um, there wasn't much value for them to, to 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 play with right. So if you were a part of the Ethereum uh, the, the Ethereum launch um, and you were part of the token sale for Ethereum, the chances are you've had plenty of tokens to be participating in many other things and. And uh, it's it's been a very very fun ride. If you know if you didn't uh, you're if you were an engineer that didn't see anything until you know after the, the fall of 2018, you know mm -hmm. you, you have to take your hard earned dollars that come from generally a, a corporate often a corporate job uh, and um, you try to follow people that uh, either had a lot of financial ability beforehand um, or were a part of that initial initial rise. Um, so you know when. I got into often got into conversations with, and I've helped build certain networks throughout the last five years, six years uh, about bringing other open source developers in and getting capturing their interest and getting their involvement. And there are just so many projects that people are burnt out from trying to think and learn about new things. If the value isn't there, it takes years of your life to push in and a, very, a lot of passion to, to go and to, to kickstart something and to be a part of these communities that develop. And um, you know the 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 organization started to run more like um, you know VC led startups 
rather than uh, these these grassroots networks uh, mm -hmm. that, that are being built out, uh, that were being thought of and, and, and built out. Um, so, you know, in in this in this path to trying to figure out how to create and bring more value back to uh, what the developer community brings uh, to the to the overall ecosystem. Um, you know, a number of networks uh, who I had been speaking with and, and, and talking about launching, um, you know, ha had asked what I could do to uh, try to tap into um, a, a large group of developers that were not even yet in the ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this the concept was born, trying to determine a path, a decentralized method of you know, governance based on you know, large grants from, from networks, newer networks uh, that uh, we as peers uh, could create a governance system to distribute properly. Um, so not, not having um, you know, it be VC led, uh, mm -hmm. having it be peer led. Um, and you know, into that process, the idea of DAOs or DACs you know, really has existed since from around 2013. Uh, you know, a lot of people would, would attribute maybe Dan Larimer even to, to some of the earlier ideas where, with where BitShares was. Uh, there were a number of other projects along the way that contributed, but the, the real, um, the real boom was the DAO, uh, the, the VC, uh, DAO. Yeah, that I mean was, boom. Right. Both yeah. boom and bust and, yeah. and, 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 and the, and the breaking of code is law. Right. So, so they, they, they kind of crash and, and, and the, the, the idea in itself was a great idea. And these, this concept of organization moving to these asset light, flat hierarchy, uh, meritocratic organizations um, mm. is is something that you know many people in, inside and outside of this interest, industry are very interested in, um, and trying to create better governance systems and structures to create efficiencies to remove maybe middle management, uh, maybe redundant jobs with smart contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, utilizing the technology is, is what was the really capturing a lot of interest. It fits a couple of different early models very well, the idea of- Actually, let me, let me break in, because I want to make sure I'm yep. understanding what yep. you're saying so far. It, it sounds like, you know, and we'll, we'll get to DAOs in general in a moment, but for, for DevDAO, it, it sounds like there's two parallel missions. It's to push forward the state of the technology, and the technology meaning blockchain and decentralized systems and is maybe prong number one. And then prong number two is to do that in a way where those contributing developer and engineering talent are the ones where there's a loop, a feedback loop where their efforts are being rewarded rather than them having a timing issue or a, a bad deal issue or coming in late issue or something. It's not, it sounds like there's sort of a yin yang aspect to the dev DevDAO. And it, it sound, if I'm hearing this correctly, and I'm kind of, Parroting back just for the audience, the 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 rewards or bounties or funding for this is externally driven by people, by market actors, or I shouldn't even say market actors. I should, I, you know, field participants who have an interest in pushing the state of the art forward, both for their own public purposes and for private purposes. Is is, is this fair to say? That's, that's pretty accurate. I, I'd stay away from the term bounties. Uh, we like to use the term grants. Uh, one of the early things that I recognized uh, as a developer in, in trying to put this together was that there are many uh, parts to this puzzle that need to be solved and that hadn't been solved yet. And a large part of that is the legal framework for everything that we're doing. Um, so participants and all of the different types of organizations aren't uh, important, different personas. The, the legal persona can give us the rails that we need to be able to create the organizational structures right. And uh, mm -hmm. Our goal is to distribute grants um, to, uh, to, to, to engineers helping us build out. So there's the legal framework and the technical framework that really need to, to still be built on, out on uh, and, and trying and, to and stay- And for anyone away. watching this in two years, it was me who used the term bounty and not Tim. That's right. Uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 we also need to be like, I, you know, over the trend of the last four years has been this, this tribal community of separate network networks and, and that's just ridiculous. I mean, we have so much work to do. Um, you know, we, we, ha we have to uh, get frameworks down that fit uh, for technologies and, and, and understanding how to use them in, in, in conjunction with each other. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the adage of a rising tide lifts all ships. We, we all need, we, there's so much work to be done across the board. Most mm -hmm. often solutions can be implemented uh, with end 
products or in networks or protocols as the last step, the last mile um, for, for a lot of the things that we have to get built or, or do. Uh, so I wanted to try to build something that could be as protocol agnostic as possible. Interesting. And, and what, what strikes me about the DevDAO also is it's not, it's, it has these core missions, but part of it is it seems to be a template for child clone parent DAOs that can either connect, disconnect. And I, I know Wolf has thoughts about this. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not just what it does. It's a model for other people doing what they want to do. Like you're, you know, prototyping the technologies, prototyping the governance, prototyping the legal. Yeah, we so are, that we others are, we, can cookie cut the model, even if for some other agenda, than rewarding developers and pushing forward to the state of the art. It's absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the point. I mean, the, the, the going through and trying to create open source frameworks, both legal and technical, for all other developers or all other individuals that are interested in uh, the DAO formation. Um, to, be, to be able to make this, um, you know, creating an organization and having that organization be a, a truly recognized legal construct and having proper governance systems um, to, to manage that transparently, mm -hmm. that should be easy. Uh, but founders today, when creating products or building things, they have to go through these radical business lessons and they have to go through all conversations with, 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 with lawyers to, to be able to form and they still don't understand uh, across multiple jurisdictions what it is that they should have done. Um, so ideally creating um, a globally recognized cross jurisdiction or, or, or organization is what we hope to do. Um, we just didn't feel that the model has been there yet. Uh, there'll be many different models for this for these products or these organizations, you know, we hope to create uh, a, a, a framework or multiple frameworks and have met, as many people want to use them as possible as, as an open source model. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, so th that seems like a good segue to, I, I think we got the high level, we're gonna go into depth, but I think we got the high level understanding of the DevDAO's mission, but not but, let's now take a, a big step back and talk about DAOs in general. You know what? What are you know? Let's set some framework or some context. You know what are they? How do they develop? Why do they exist? And what are they? An answer to? And I think this can be a free flowing discussion with all three of you participating. Tim, why, why don't you lead off and just you know, real basic DAO 101. What is it? How did it come into existence? What does it purport to solve? It's an autonomous organization uh, with um, you know, decentralized governance um, that uh, will allow members um, uh, to connect and uh, create functions of business um, with, with other organizations in, a, in jurisdictionally compliant manners. Uh, this is um, a way for you know, different uh, individuals that are usually separated by um, uh, jurisdictional boundaries to create uh, organizations and, and, and movements together. A very common form is the, the VC DAO model, uh, which mm -hmm. is probably the most easy to understand where you, know, you may have 10, 20, 100 people that contribute to a fund. Uh, and then there's basically a, a governance rules based on how the funds, the combined funds are uh, distributed to or invested into different projects. It, it allows people to have a, um, a governance model that they agree to when contributing their funds, uh, agreements and, on transparency for those funds, and the ability to exit and, and, and take away their funds uh, in, a, in a simple, very understood, uh, understood way. Uh, but we'll get into different models that allow for different type of organizational structures to, to exist. And, and this has been around for, you know, the idea of these flat meritocratic organizations has been around for a long time, um, but the, the use of uh, the distributed ledgers to manage the governance in these types of organizations has been around for about seven years. Is it, is it fair to say that the prerequisite for DAOs is the distributed or decentralized network infrastructure upon which it rides? Is there, is there a DAO without blockchain, internet, and decentralized nodes? You know, I, 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 yeah, that's like asking whether or not a, a public or a private blockchain is a, is a blockchain. 
right? So, so mm -hmm. you know, there, there, there's, there are things about the decentralization of the network and the security that you have in a public ledger that you mm -hmm. just don't have without it. You can operate in a flat meritocratic way. You can operate under some rules of governance, but you don't have all of the benefits of being in a decentralized distributed network. Um, so, you know, the, one of the, 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 the you know, in some of our early works about this, uh, I think Wolf uh, really goes into a great, uh, gets into a great understanding of the evolution of businesses. And, you know, mm -hmm. rather than stealing uh, his thunder, you know, Wolf, uh, why don't you kind of go into, you know, where we came from asset heavy businesses uh, to what the goal is of, of flat hierarchical businesses. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I'm, the, I'm allowed to be the dreamer here. Timothy is the realist, you know, he, he knows what's needed and the tech that's, that has to be built. I'm more interested or most interested in what DAOs can be in the future, right? I mean, that's really where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually see DAO governance as a way to, to it's almost like its own blockchain universe, right? So it's a, it's a way to, so in other words, if a, if a DAO internal governance works, truly works in a decentralized way, the best way to demonstrate that it works is actually block propagation, right? Can you show that this voting structure that you're using truly works for the internal governance of the system? And if that truly is decentralized and attack resistant, which is one of the, the key parameters that, that I always cared about. It has to be attack resistance. So we have to get, get over sock puppet attacks. We have to get over 51% attacks, all the attack vectors. And I have one paper where I list some 15 attack vectors. If we can overcome those, the, the, the internal governance metrics is perfect also for block propagation. Now, nobody wants to talk about this at this point, right? I'm the dreamer. But um, so, so, so that's one, one aspect of it. But then also think about, and this is something that we struggle with internally in, in, the, in the DevDAO. What happens if we can do this truly anonymous, right? The power of the system comes from an anonymity. You can literally overcome human condition, right? The way we discriminate against others, the way we hurt each other, all these things that, that afflict the human humanity, right? That, that, that um, where the existing centralized governance systems were intended to overcome the, those human problems, very human problems, but we haven't. We just have a patchwork of things that really mm, that don't really work. So what I care about is the ultimate vision of this, right? Can you build a DAO in anonymous, decentralized and autonomous systems that helps overcome many of the, the restrictions in business and society that we're experiencing right now. So the DevDAO, to me personally, that's why I'm so excited about this project, is the first project where I see that people actually understand what decentralized infrastructure products are needed that come out of DAO constructs to give us more reality in the vision, if that makes sense. I can stop here. Well, let, let, let me kind of follow up on that. So, Suppose someone came to you and said that existing legal forms have been around for hundreds of years and to the extent they go wrong, it's because the humans involved go wrong and you're just moving the problem, you're not solving it. By the way, I'm not saying what I just said is correct. I'm just saying, you know, I'm playing devil's advocate. How do you, how do you get to the part where the DAO offers something unique that existing structures not only don't, but couldn't or can't just by their very nature. So what happens in existing structures, if you, let me oversimplify this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Congress, the courts, they come in and say, oh, we're fixing a problem. We need to govern society and we need to give a framework and we need to give people rules and legal certainty so markets can grow and we need to, mm -hmm. put, right? That's, that's what we do as lawyers. And so they put a presumptively stable and presumptively optimal rule in, in place that fixes the problem, assuming that they did cost benefit analysis, which they often cannot do because they have bounded information, uh, bounded rationality, limited information, information asymmetries, all that, all those problems, right? So they put the stable rule in and things move on. Society evolves at a rapid pace. So I have several papers where I talk about um, mm -hmm. the disruptive effects of technology and how things change in society, right? 
And what do we, what, what, as long as what we do is we constantly pay, ca uh, play catch up, right? So, mm -hmm. but if you look at the way we do it, we do it in linear trends, but we live in an exponential society where, where things change much quicker, much quicker, much, much faster than the law can actually catch up with them. So th this, this is sort of a basic insight that we need dynamical governance. It has to be dynamic. It has to revolve around feedback effects. We can't do that in centralized structures. The system wasn't built for that. We that's can do it, point. in my opinion, in a right. DAO, decentralized DAO environment. And that's the experimentation that takes place in the dev DAO, in my opinion. Now, a lot of people in the dev DAO, they look at this as a technical solution. Mm -hmm. they, they, and that's fine. And that's, they should, right? We need that expertise. But what this experimentation does, what we can do with this is overcome all many of the limitations that I see in centralized structures. You're, you're almost making like a cybernetic argument, like you a, a self-adjusting system that takes action, sees what that action costs as a result, and then adjusts further based on that feedback and keeps on going. It's interesting you say that because that's the chapter I just wrote last night on cybernetic uh, systems yeah yeah so so um it's a it, it so it's, it has to be dynamical and um self-adjusting but we can't do that right now in centralized structures because you have the top-down structure that needs the legitimacy from the above level mm -hmm. and it can't happen the, the governance can't happen in a flat hierarchy right so the question the key question is how do you do this in a flat hierarch hierarchical structure and so one way the, the Dev DAO is, has started to conceptualize this is to say, okay, well, we'll, we'll do a micro democracy. Now, I don't want to trigger political debate here on the feasibility of that, but it's validation pools, right? It's, it's the way we, we contemplate governing uh, by way of validation pools and reputation staking. And I, we can put that on the back burner for now and talk about some other things and then get back to it later. If well, like. let me, because I want to go kind of over the history and how we got here, what DAO experiments have preceded the Dev DAO, and where did they go right and where did they go wrong, such that Dev DAO emerged as the current best hope of, of mankind? Let me let me let me get into some of this. All right, so so you know, BitShares, an interesting project, and it was uh, this 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 convers you know this uh, organization that that helped build DAX. Uh, mm -hmm. which is not uh, too different, but understood these things to be decentralized autonomous corporations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that the, the, it just, you know, it was too early for the idea, too early for the technology. None of the laws were there to help any of these things exist in a way that fit with any jurisdictional rights or, or concepts. People were selling illegal securities. They messed up. The system really is not that widely used. Uh, mm -hmm. The Dow came along and you know, code is law. They were all, you know, all idealists. Everyone came and decided to build the system on top of a, a brand new shiny Ethereum, which was a, the latest, greatest system for launching tokens out of the box. Uh, everyone, everyone got really excited, put a bunch of money into a single, a single smart contract. That, that, that contract itself, uh, there was a security issue with the contract, uh, got drained of all of its value, created a huge scandal. Uh, really changed the really out outlook and, and out an outcome of Ethereum uh, by them having to halt the network, uh, mm -hmm. re reverse blocks, uh, split the network into two, uh, which is now Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, uh, really kind of tarnished the, the, the uh, benevolence or tarnished the, 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 the direction of, of, of how easy these things might be because you recognize that maybe code isn't law, maybe there's some law that's law as well, that needs to help some people uh, while we're still building these things. Um, you know, no, 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 actually, sorry, let me pause a second. I, I just want to highlight and then go on. I, I want to highlight that the, the issue with the DAO, the one you're referencing is one that I'm always wrestling with, which is obviously you want to get the network decentralized, censorship resistant, resilient, you know, resistant to all the attacks that Wolf articulates, but there always seems to be sort of a, a boot phase where people are figuring it out. And then there's a shading from kind of like left to right as it starts centralized and then goes decentralized. And it's, it always strikes me so tricky from a technical point of view and from a legal point of view. And it's just, it's, it's just, what's amazing. I, I thought the Dow 
really brought it up. It, let, let me throw out one other thing. It, it's funny. When the Dow attack was happening, I was with Vlad Zamfir in Odessa. You know, Vlad from Ethereum and Casper, of course. And we were having nonstop debates about whether code is law and whether how they should proceed. So I, I lived it. And this is just when I was getting involved in this area. It, it, it was fascinating from a technical point of view, from a community management point of view, from a leadership point of view, from a legal point of view. And, and, and Wolf, I, I, I know you want to comment on this. I, I saw. So add. I, uh, I actually agree with the um, prevailing opinion, quote unquote, and people who've been in this space for a while, that there there have been three phases in DAOs, right? So the first mm -hmm. DAO was the Wild West, hey, we don't care about legal solutions we can do. And I was really influenced by that myself. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do all of this, you know, uh, on chain, we, on chain governance, we don't need the legal wrapper, that's, that's not needed. And then reality started setting in and people started realizing, well, you know, we need to interface with the real world. And so second generation started to say, oh, you know, maybe we need to think about some of these solutions. Um, so that was um, what a couple of years ago. And then the third generation is what I see us in right now, which is we rather than think about legal rappers ex post, we now think about legal rappers ex ante in the sense that we say, okay, well, we have to set a, a legal framework in which the DAO can actually operate. But we set up the legal framework first, make sure that that works, and then in, in integrate the DAO from that perspective. So in that sense, it's really crucially different from the second generation. So uh, we're, we're kind of anticipating where the conversation is going, but, but let's go with it. Do you see legal entities as sort of the boot phase for something that's ultimately beyond traditional law? Do you see it as something that's sort of covalently bonded with a network entity or where do you, where do you see this ending up? So you're asking me? I guess Whoever. I'm asking all of you and maybe, yeah. maybe I didn't, uh, maybe I didn't uh, ask it well. It's, it's, so, it's, e it's easy, Gordon. It's easy, Gordon. The, the structures that we need for legal operation of these organizations just simply aren't there yet. Um, the, mm -hmm. like, like Wolf had mentioned earlier, like we can create technology. If, if the, the laws haven't caught up with the technology they, they will never, be in parallel with technology. Technology will always exponentially outpace the legal system. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we 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 recognize that. Uh, we we try to you know, work on some of the uh, existing theories that have, that have gone over the last couple of years on how these things should exist. But we mm -hmm. know we need to do a lot of political work to change some law to be able to create the type of organizational structures that we all, I, I, you know, idealize. Uh, and then Burned has, has been such a great help in, in, um, in helping educate us on different uh, forms and systems in, in Switzerland, who, which has been a great jurisdiction uh, thus far in, uh, type, in, in, in organizational structure uh, and, 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 and compliance and helping us uh, create this new association structure um, that we believe is the, the closest thing to what we will want until we can have a larger amount of um, of, of laws changed to create the ideal uh, infrastructure. So taking Wolf's point, do, do, do you have any lingering affinity or romantic feeling towards, I guess, pirate DAOs, ones that are not trying to interface with this existing legal system, but or Monero DAOs, whatever, you know, I'm just making that up. So but, I, I want to also be clear, Gordon, many of the views mm -hmm. that I'm, um, Give, provide, providing here, they're my own. They haven't internally been discussed in the DevDAO, right? So my views are my own. I, mm. I like I like to see that DevDAO uh, is open to my views, but that doesn't mean they're all the DevDAO's views, okay? So when I say certain things, please don't attribute them directly to the DevDAO project, right? Okay, so for the everyone watching this in, dreaming, in 20... And then there's the DevDAO implementation, which is a totally mm. different ballgame, right? I want to be so, very clear up front about this. So, you know, okay. Okay, uh, so yeah, for everyone I, yeah, watching this every, in 2022... Every, for everyone every watching this in 2022, okay, Wolf and I, our lawyers, we're not your lawyer. We're, <laughs> we're merely discussing topics and theorizing. We're not making affirmative right. statements of fact or opinion. This is a shooting the breeze and imagining show. And if you right. want, okay, and feel free to take my deposition because that's how it was framed and that's what we're doing. Yeah, so so do not hold question. anything anyone's saying against anyone. We're just talking. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so you can ask me anything. <laughs> you, you, you know what, actually, You've been suspiciously silent, but I know you're the the big guy in Zug. What what's your what you, 
beyond even your initial involvement in, in blockchain, Bitcoin, and crypto, when did you, when did DAOs cross your awareness, and how have you felt about their evolution? And I guess you know, what what angle do you see to the DevDAO project that brought you in? Yeah. So, so uh, first of all, I'm I'm trying to solve problems all the time. So, and the the good thing is that I probably never know that it's not solvable. So I'm I'm still trying, and people don't tell me it's not solvable. Um, so the, the first problem I encountered was that I was part of a project that didn't have an entity. We, the, the people were liberal um, blockchain crypto anarchists that mm -hmm. still did, didn't want to do any any kind of entity. And then I realized we're a group of people that are all liable and we're split around the world. So, and we did an ICO actually. So um, I was a bit scared by that. So then I, I tried to find out what, what is a solution that these people would accept, you know, the group mm -hmm. I'm, I'm working with, but also keep us on the, on the, from, from being liable. So actually I created my own company and then did all the interaction with the real world, so to, so to say, so the, the traditional world, let's say, but I used to work with new technologies and to this group of people. So I was sort of the, the bridge between this new world and the old world. And, uh, but that, that was not really the solution. So I felt it was like an intermediary solution. So then I, then I thought about um, what are frameworks that we could use that are almost similar to a DAO, which is very democratic. It's so, sort of um, bottom up decision-making, you know, the, mm -hmm. the whole group makes a decision and it will be executed by a few, maybe it's, it's the, the opposite approach to, to any entity today. So uh, mm -hmm. you have the top down approach decisions are made up on top and executed below. So, um, so I, I looked into the um, Swiss sort of uh, entity world and I, I realized that one of the biggest entities in the world is actually an, an association. And an association is, is just a group of people that come together, they, they decide on things and it's been executed by the, um, by the top people. And this is FIFA, the, the mm -hmm. World Soccer Federation. You know, they're, they're an association. So I realized if, if that's possible for them, why not sort of try that for us? And um, so the, the first uh, part I, I looked into is how to create an association. And then we, uh, a group of people that I, that I also encountered here in Switzerland, was very interested in this topic or we, we all created this topic together. And one of the developers that was involved, Sebastian Bürkel, he actually wrote this, the, the bylaws into smart contracts. Mm -hmm. So now we have this, this framework of an association with all the governance being inside as um, smart contracts. And to me, this was sort of the first time I realized, yeah, this is possible. It's possible to have a decentralized frame or um, solution or execution at least inside a legal entity that is accepted. And the, the beauty uh, or the, the things I always try to do is hide, not hide purposely, but hide things from, from other people so that they don't fear this new technology because they see the association, they know what it is, they know how to interact with it. They can do this. So bank account, we can open a bank account with an association. If I talk to them and say we are a DAO, then you know they, they will not know what it is. So the the the, the next you, step. Let me jump in. It's, it's interesting. You're you're using an object-oriented programming technique, like encapsulation. You're you're spearing the user, the internal mechanisms that get the job done, and just presenting them with, with a nice, friendly interface that they know and are familiar with. Yeah, I, I've learned to, so when you communicate, I've learned that you have to communicate on the recipient side. You don't have mm -hmm. to communicate what you want to say. You want to say it the way that he accepts it or he understands it. So right. if I talk to the, to the uh, tax authorities in Switzerland, I tell them I have a different currency, like a US dollar. How do I convert that to Swiss francs? And then they told me exactly what to do. And I said, okay, now if I do this with Ether, this, will this work? And then they accepted it. You know, so that's how I, I got into the um, my, my bookkeeping Smart. into accepting crypto in, in 2016 already. So mm -hmm. so uh, all that worked and um, and I, I'm using the, the mechanisms that people are, are used to. So that's that's how I try to to yeah uh, um, communicate the results or the the the, the solution I have. Um, so it, it's fascinating you're referencing FIFA because as I understand it, it's like an umbrella organization 
for a confederation of other independent organizations, which gets to what you guys are all talking about, which is this is not just a standalone DAO. This is a model and a template for other people who want to stand up their own DAOs and for DAOs that want to relate to each other. So FIFA is exactly. a perfect it's, example. It's, as you say, that there is an umbrella organization that sets the framework and sort of sets the governance. And that's where, where uh, Wolf can, can explain a lot of things about. And others have to accept that to be, to be part of that. So you can, you can create your own organization and be part of the bigger organization if you accept the rules that you have to or the governance that you have to participate by. So this is exactly the, 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 the thing we also uh, sort of envision at the later stage that this might be something that other people want to look at and uh, participate in or other DAOs or whatever. So, but I, I don't want to... Uh, uh, sort of take away too much from from other topics. Let, let me, no, let me it, say it, something it, real quick, Gordon. Um, so two things, two things, real quick. Everyone is a part of the organization, uh, as Wolf mentioned earlier, is uh, on their own. This is very much of a volunteerist community. Uh, there is no top-down uh, leadership, so it is a uh, an organization that everyone can come to and uh, express uh, ideally the the things that they would like to get done for whatever it is that they're seeking out of. Um, uh, seeking out of DAOs and creating DAOs uh, for themselves. Um, ultimately, we don't think that the structure should be a total umbrella for every DAO. We're not looking for that. Uh, what we are looking to do is create frameworks and then go after the, the legal change to be able to have people uh, adopt fully recognizable, jurisdictionally compliant um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, new organizations for themselves. Uh, we just exist in a moment of time where those structures don't exist yet. Um, so we're trying to create now the, the kind of bridge framework that it will right. take to get to uh, the, the optimal experience. Uh, so in the meantime, um, you know, we're trying to create um, you know, minimum viable protocol parameters to exist amongst different DAO organizations to be able to operate uh, both with themselves and with uh, external organizations. Isn't it fascinating? The project's pioneering on in so many lanes or channels, and they're all interacting with each other. But they're, they're I mean, to get the technology straight is a challenge. You're, you're describing, you know, the, the fact that developers get spread over multiple projects and the incentives are kind of out of whack. To come up with a legal framework is a whole different domain, but it's related. To work with the regulators and get the tax straight, it, it, it's just an interesting, multifaceted project. So let me ask you, when you have this vision, okay, you woke up and you have this vision, but there's a difference between having the idea and vision and actually doing something. And ever since you and I have been talking and, and you know, you were kind enough to invite me to, into, to work with you a little bit on aspects of this, it's been moving very fast. So let, let's, for, for, when did the switch go from idea to do it? And what did you do to do it, to get it started? Yeah. Um, so, you know, about two and a half, three years ago, uh, I founded a, a, a hedge fund, a crypto asset hedge fund, Ikigai Asset Management, and you know, worked on building that out um, over you know, a couple year period of time. And I, I recognized uh, about a year ago that really my place where I get more excited in is the, uh, the birth and um, you know, bringing people together to create something. I also realized that I didn't, uh, my, my passion for the technology and for what we're doing in the technology doesn't, isn't just uh, financially motivated and it's not just uh, about creating um, you know, just the value in assets for other investors. It's about creating systems and really these decentralized governance systems um, that are going to be important for you know, the, the, the world that we will all live in in the future. And um, you know, in the last two years, I had been involved with a number of different projects that wanted me to get to dive deep in. I, I, I was heavily involved in the launching of, of EOS and uh, there were a lot of things that, that, that were ideal for me early on, then my feelings changed about the way that they were being run. Uh, there, there were many governance issues and, and um, you know, just, just I was kind of saddened in, in parts of the, 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 the developer community and, and the, that it really wasn't flourishing in the way that I think it could have been. Uh, and so I was kind of, uh, kind, of, kind, of kind of disappointed uh, by some of the, the venture side of the things that were were not getting completed. And um, as other projects started to emerge, and people would ask me, my interest just wasn't there. Um, so, you know, I, I tried to work with uh, a, a very large uh, layer one protocol that, that will remain nameless uh, to, to, to bring forward this idea. 
um, and I couldn't get them to budge. It, it seemed as if uh, that, 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 that they were still too, you know, proprietary and holding on to their IP and, and, and mm -hmm. their beliefs and the value of their network without understanding uh, the beauty in, in decentralization and, and open source. Um, and, and, you know, it was in that continual effort, I realized that I really wanted to get this done, uh, that, mm -hmm. that I do realize those that aren't going to move towards open source and true decentralization, they will be left in the wake. This is not a, 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 a network and not a time for um, being closed on your ideas and thoughts. And mm -hmm. it's a time to where we have to, you know, we have to bring in, in our community, in the, in the blockchain and the cryptographic asset community, we have a lot of onboarding to do of external developers. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, for many different types of, of personas. And so uh, I, I, I was given the opportunity uh, through Casper Labs. Um, Casper was building out their network, working with, with Vlad Zemfir, uh, working with a lot of other people, basically on a research project for um, the, the Casper Correct by Construction uh, consensus protocol mm -hmm. and trying to figure out where I would, uh, you know, how I would be involved, if I would get involved um, in that path. I, you know, was approached by several people on the team and, and asked about what I, what I wanted to do, uh, what it would take for me to get involved. And, and I said it would take a, a ridiculous commitment of the, the value of your network um, that I have, you know, I will create a structure for, um, but I will have no, um, you know, no, no oversight and management in how this will be uh, distributed and, and, and directed. Um, that, that the DAO structure could be created to where we could really have a group of peers uh, come together and um, build products, frameworks uh, in a completely decentralized, protocol agnostic way uh, that will move forward the entire industry. Um, that I would also um, not be beholden to any part of their network, that I could go off and, and, and work on other networks, bring other networks in, create a truly non tribalistic method of trying to. to, to, to um, evolve the network, uh, you know, evolve the layer two um, software elements that all of these networks need uh, without being beholden to the, the layer one protocol that might be funding or financing uh, parts of, of what needs to be built. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I had a, um, uh, the, this, this outlash of, of, of work that came in a couple of letters uh, to uh, some of the key members of, of, of the Casper team. And uh, you yeah, know, I'm sorry, repeat that sentence. You, you had an outlash of I didn't yeah. I just I started firing out you know emails you know in these tirades of of, of information about why this stuff was wasn't, wasn't going to work unless unless yeah. uh, you know you let the set the developers free um, yeah. you know not not to be beholden to the uh, the, the speculators and uh, so you, you had you know, your Jerry Maguire moment. It's what it was. I was just sick. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, ultimately, uh, I, th I thought I was going to be, I thought the, the number that I had given them on the value that, that I would expect to, to even move the, the ball uh, was going to be uh, laughed at. And, and ultimately, uh, the vision that I think a lot of them have is, is truly about decentralization and open source. And uh, they've been so gracious and kind to allow us to work with this vision and allow us to push this forward. Um, so, you know, they gave us really the start uh, in, in the ability to have uh, the organization and uh, now we're moving on and, and we're seeking out uh, additional grants we really want the whole ecosystem to recognize that we're not protocol dependent um, mm -hmm. that we are going to be able to act independently uh, and that we have no uh, requirements from from any of the grantors uh, that, that that help us in our mission um, but ultimately it's my belief that the more developers and the more um, other personas uh, externally that we can bring in to help build the software that's required uh, to, to, to create some of the level two, the layer two solutions will lift the entire industry up. Um, you know, there, there's many development uh, changes and improvements that have come in the last, you know, three, four years, five years. I mean, what's gonna come in the next four or five? There's, there's mm -hmm. just the continual evolution of the, the, the software system underneath that we're building on. So uh, very, very happy to have uh, had their blessing and you know, continuing the work and continuing to go out uh, and find other interesting systems that uh, you know really really are interested in having software built on top and, and, and useful things on these networks. We can't just continue to build layer ones. We have to build things on top. I, I, I've always felt that the, the thing I love about open source software is you can fork it, and the thing I hate about it is you can fork it because it fractionalizes, it, it atomizes these communities and their social and their politics and their and they send so much effort 
sort of differentiating themselves that they lose the forward momentum. And, and I think what's beneficial about what DevDAO is doing, and I applaud you and Casper for being true to the vision is from the get-go, make obviating the need to fork or to separate because you're already independent, you're already autonomous. So forking would be, you know, declaring independence from what? You're just providing a, a service out there that people can develop that's not being, it's not beholden to a commercial or sectoral interest, even though, you know, they're being good and providing the boot, some boot resources for it in anticipation of others jumping in. Uh, that's a, that's an open-minded perspective. And, you know, the, the, the day the days that close of proprietary network protocols is gone. I mean, you, you know, yeah, thank totally God agree with the that. IP. Yeah, um, I mean, free, free, free and open source software, you know, so is evolving as well. I mean, the, the, the ability for, for groups and engineers to, to really, um, you know, create, um, you know, sustainable uh, living, uh, living off of uh, open source needs to evolve. And, yeah. um, you know, you re realistically, we are you know, 25 years, 23 years divorced from, you know, the, the, this, this kind of rapid movement when, when, when Linux really started to catch a hold and uh, Stallman really started to do a lot of, a lot of the work that, that he produced and, and the, the cathedral and the bazaar. And as we're continuing to, to build up steam, you know, we, we need to be able to have um, you know, governance structures uh, to be able to, to, to push a lot of this stuff forward. Yeah, everything should be open. Everything that this is how humanity moves forward without, uh, the, without closing the, the walls on ideas. Um, you know, ideas are, aren't owned by anyone and, and hopefully benefit everyone. Uh, so hopefully we can just continue in that effort. And he, and he, he, he's gotten so large and so complex, you can't just rely on the sacrifices of individual de developers. You, that's why I think the grant system is worthwhile. If, if there's a knowable, if, you, if you're not gonna be out there in the desert just slaving away for the world's benefit and you know, having no shoes, but you're somehow gonna be taken care of or get a feedback loop from your efforts. It's almost like well, cybernetic system. The more you put out, the more you adjust, the more you take into account what's happening and keep on readjusting, keep on recontributing, you, you have a future, it, it, it has legs. Yeah. Whereas yeah, I, I think could. you're saying before it is very, it was very difficult, you know, people working full-time jobs, they have families and when did they find that hour to contribute? And you see yeah, all I mean, these projects that start, they have a bunch of fire, it gets too complex, the person's trying to run their own life and it kind of just dies on the vine. So you know, I, I, I like the idea of providing an economic model for sustainability in open source. Right, and uh, you know, what, what I would mention is that there's many, uh, you know, people are trying to evolve many different types of economic models for open source developers. But one of the things that, that we really are trying to do is, is, is as we grow in membership, um, the, 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 the members that are, uh, that, that are involved do have uh, some reasonable expectation of continual financial resources to be able to continue mm -hmm. to contribute. Um, we're, we're also looking for people that have had major contributions to other open source projects in and out of the cryptographic asset space, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that they feel comfortable, feel, can feel involved and don't feel pressured into, you know, uh, taking large amounts of maybe their savings to, to get involved and then to, to see a benefit later from the, uh, the, the growth of the networks and the things that, that they build. Um, so but it's not a multi market. It's not a multi level marketing play. But it's definitely not a multi level oh, marketing. I'm play. kidding, obviously. The, um, oh, okay, so you 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 had this vision. You spoke to Casper. You you made a big ask. They were receptive to it. You had your Jerry Maguire moment of spamming everyone with passion. You probably woke up the next morning going, "What the hell did I do?" Like he did. <laughs> And Luckily, I had a lawyer friend that helped me out, and it, it allowed me to, to bounce ideas before I hit the send button on everything. Uh, yeah, that's, there, there, that's a good idea. Uh, you know, I, I it's good to have a lawyer and a spouse or spouse equivalent to, to like you know hold the fire. It, but then, so th but you moved extremely rapidly, putting together good not just good team but good teams plural, divided them into working groups, kept people on. Schedules, you know, I, I love that the meetings I've done or participated in, you know, they are an hour. I've never seen that before in my life. Like they, they don't actually trail over. They really seem to be an hour. Yet stuff happens. Obviously, you know, Wolf and Burn and you know, you know, all these other people are doing massive amounts of work behind the scene. But it seems to be almost approached from a software project management point of view. Even though you're dealing with much more than software, you're dealing with legal and everything else. So how did you? How did you? get it so you got casper 
supporting it? How did you make your initial other human, how did you get other humans to become involved actively? What was, what happened next? I mean, I'm always just making it up as I go along, Gordon. That's the, that's the, the most brilliant part about it, right? That's, that's, that's what's fun. But what you do is you, you just, you tap on, you tap to the right people who you know will get involved and know will take action. You know, you know ultimately in any sort of you know, community growth, I think you're, you're trying to program yourself out of a job. Uh, you know, it's not just going to work if it's, if it's me driving. So, you know, the benefit of the last five years is that, you know, I've spent much of the time going around meeting other influential, interesting people from all different aspects of what you need for this sort of organization. I went through and I, and I, and I, and I tapped the resources that I thought might be interested, brought people in that I knew could and, and, and would be, a, were, were idealists, were doers, were people that I, I knew could actually get things done. And then I've just been surprised to see the amount of, of effort and work. Uh, you know, I, I, I so much applaud and, and it's not, this is not something that, that I've done. This is something that, that we all continue to do. You know, I, I, I definitely think that this is not a, um, you know, this is a continuously evolving organization. Ideally, organizations will evolve to where you know, people who were parts of the founding and origination of the groups may fade in and fade out uh, mm -hmm. through time. Um, because different people have to take charge and different people have to get things done with different amounts of passion and experience and expertise throughout the life cycle of, you know, the development of an organization. Yep. Now, let me ask you, did, did you, were you aware of, I mean, Wolf's academic? Oh, yeah. I got, I got a big, I got a big argument, big argument with Wolf uh, on, on stage uh, like two years ago or so, three, two and a half years ago, not an argument. But Wait, hold on, let, had, let me ask the question, but I, I want to hear that also. It, Wolf, Wolf seems bizarrely aligned with the mission of the DevDAO. Like it was like his twin brother came up with it and then dropped it on his doorstep as the perfect gift. Like no one, no one could know someone's internal processes so well because you know the this is almost like a, a, a perfect testing ground manifestation prototype of the stuff he's been working on for years. So. I wonder, but did, did you know that about him, or how, how did this very interesting stream of events manifest? You know, so and, I, then I, ahead, I, and then I want to hear about the argument because oh, it's, it's all it's all it's all part of that. You know, so so you know, when we first got together, we, we were we were on stage uh, discussing you know decentralization, discussing different networks uh, several years ago at, at San Francisco, and you know, I had a, a lot of a, a lot of respect. I mean, he is an academic; I am not an academic. You know, I, I am someone who, who is largely a child of the, of the internet and, uh, you know, found my own resources to, to learn, but have a lot of respect for those that have gone through uh, the true trials and tribulations of academia. And, um, you know, from the moment that we had met, uh, we became, you know, social network friends, and I was able to follow some of his passions, follow some of the things that he, he, he was working on. I recognized that he did truly have um, the, the, the ideal, uh, the ideals and, 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 and the, 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 you know, honorable intentions for the things that he wanted to see out of the systems, you know, the, the arguments against how they were being used in, in 2017 and 2018 were valid. And I totally, you know, didn't, didn't disagree with them there. We had just had it, it kind of different ways of, you know, whether or not to be excited or whether or not to be interested at the time in these different things that were happening. And I, I, I get excited about things. Um, but, you know, I like his, I like dissenting views. I like people who are going to have strong opinions. I think that's important, uh, especially those that, that have you know put in the, the time, the effort, uh, and, and and have the the, the accolades and, and the work to show that they are passionate about the things that they do. Um, so you know, new to call Wolf, and uh, you know, as as this was coming forward, you know, he was he was definitely one of the, one of the, uh, the, the the persons that I, that I immediately had thought of and said, you know. If, if I can, you know, convey this to him in a way that uh, he uh, can, can, can become uh, interested, uh, then I know I'm, I'm, I'm on to something. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can build a, a team out of doing that. I, you know, through that, through the, the initial moments, um, what I was very pleasantly surprised about is, is, is his level of effort and interest and drive uh, to, uh, to, to, to help model some of the things. And, you know, None of these foundations have been you know, ultimately built. There's so many open holes in the, in, in the eventual system that we have to create. Uh, so we have to have different views on the right way of getting to the thing that we all desire. Mm. That takes being very pliable and that takes being very, you know, that takes being able to listen.
Uh, and, and so we'll there's a whole Hegelian process that goes on during all the discussions. I think it's really fascinating. And it, if if I may we'll comment on that on the past, Timothy, uh, just for a second. So um, on that panel that you describe in San Francisco some two or three years ago, I got yelled at. Literally, there was a group there that I don't want to get into now. Okay, that that booed me. Okay, <clears throat> because I I talked about you know creating solutions for for the average person, you know, and there were other people there who wanted to make sure that they can capitalize on this. And I felt, Timothy, you know, you may say, you may think that we were, we were ad, ad, adversarial to each other, but I actually felt that you were helping me by moderating the group. And so I, I felt drawn to you from the, from the start, basically, right? I, I was. So I felt worry. that there was this kindred spirit and we only, you know, so anyway, so that, that's how this started and then, you know, I, I followed Timothy and saw what he does and saw his spirit. And then, you know, we, we got together and it, it flowed from there and it floats really well, so. That's great. And then so, for, for Bern, sorry, Tim, go ahead. No, the, the, this is me, Corda, but because I, th I think this is really fascinating. So you yes. already had some sort of relationship between the two of you. You met up, you met face to face. There was a connection already. But the, the, the one thing I'm curious about, what was it that caught your attention to, to this project? because you had a relationship with Tim anyway, but when Tim started to share in his vision, his why, why he got involved, why he was excited, you know, what's going to happen for the future, what caught your attention? So you, you never know when you start, right? But then every meeting I got on, people said the right things. And the more people said the right things, and I knew Timothy, I trusted Timothy, right? So yeah. I wanted to, to hear more from Timothy. But then, you know, it was also the, prof uh, the, the, the way that it was, pro it was professional. You know, there's a lot of groups, they are all over the place. And so, mm -hmm. so little things like Timothy had a protocol. Every time, you know, people would take notes, it was, it was professionally done. And then I was like, oh, okay, this is different. This is not a bunch of, anyways. Yeah. So, um, and so everything, and then people said the right things. They were receptive to some of the, the broader uh, visionary things that I'm I'm talking about a lot, and that drew me in. That's just every every meeting was a little bit extra that drew me in. That's great. And and, and Bert, the give us your version. Uh, so I I heard. Uh, don't, don't tell me Tim yelled at you also. No 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 I I didn't know Tim before so. Um, yeah. I heard about the project and I visited a, a presentation that Timothy held. Uh, Actually, I'm sorry. One thing I should mention: you, you, you just sorry, and then it's all yours. You have been absolutely 100% key because it's it's that association idea. It, the the nuances of, the nuances of it didn't really dawn on me at first, but it, it, the essence of an association is the essence of a DAO. It's this sort of non-corporate, free. I think it was him, like Tim was saying, people come, people go, it adapts, it's dynamic. It's, you know, as an American lawyer, I've, I've always been nervous about associations just because of liability and other issues. And you sort of, at least opened my eyes about the unique Swiss nature of this platform, which I never even, never turned my brain to. And if I had my preconceptions would have blocked it. So you, you've, added so much value and it's been just fascinating watching the dialogue go back and forth. So I, I just want to give you some kudos and some context and go ahead, please. Thank you very much. But it's, it was not just my, my own idea, but coming back to, to how I joined. So I listened to, to Timothy presented and I love mm -hmm. the idea that to, to give out grants to people that build something and uh, support them and so on. This is also what I loved about the DAO because it was also about proposals, voting on them and supporting mm -hmm. them. So it's, there, there was a similarity. And um, so, but when they, when Timothy sort of was asked, what, what how do you set this up? How, who is the entity behind it? How do we interact with that? He mentioned something that I really disliked. He, he talked about, uh, I thought it was uh, Wisconsin or- uh, um, Wyoming. Uh, so, Wy Wyoming. Sorry, Wyoming <laughs> entity. And I, I was like, whoa, guys, you know, we, we cannot, put a centralized entity and they call it a DAO or, or you know, that, that, that does, to me, that really was, was the moment. And this is, I think, 
the moment where, where all these open source projects also benefit from. If you look at a project, you really like it, you really like the vision and everything, but you think they're going into a wrong direction or they, they, they don't have something straight, then you get involved. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was my moment. So I, I had to get involved because I thought at least that I had a good idea on, on how, how we could, could create this. Um, and I brought up the association and I, I'm, I'm really grateful for uh, you guys being so receptive to this. And we actually created a much better version than, than I had uh, brought up to at the beginning, because I really think that it's still an association, just, just to understand that it's still a centralized entity. There is still a board, there's still a few people that are responsible, that are sort of the representing it. And that to me is a centralized um, uh, yeah, Construct. structure, exactly. So what, but what we came up with is actually really, and this was within the discussions in the, in the dev DAO, it was not, and it was not just my idea, it was really the feedback and everything um, that, that, that we realized if we out, so, sort of take the DAO outside, but have a delegate of the DAO representing the DAO within the association and all the decision-making is in the DAO, but the execution is in the ex association. Then we take the liability into the association and still have an entity that, that is, can execute and, and sort of uh, receive funds and, and interact with the outside world. But we still have the decision-making and that's the important point within um, a decentralized organization. So, so I think that's, so it's even better in my opinion now than, than just having mm -hmm. an association um, sort of covering a DAO. It's now the DAO is, is um, yeah, a, a, separate, a separate entity. And that's hopefully where we come to at some point as well, that we really create a DAO entity. Because I, I think that's not impossible. It's just, and it's actually something that needs to be done. Because if you think about um, the internet is, is worldwide and uh, all, all companies are in, interacting worldwide. You can buy online, uh, you know, everything uh, in, in, in China and so on. So um, to me, it's, it's clear that it, there should be an entity type that is international, that is, has no, no jurisdiction per se, you know, um, where, it's, where it's built for. So you know, I, I always comment that, you know, it, it's, it's crazy just with different country law, but in the United States, corporations, there's no such thing as United States company. Or corporation there's a california corporation or a utah corporation or wyoming llc the fact that we have 50 states plus puerto rico and guam and you know each one of these laws is different it's it's nuts it's it's the opposite of dynamic and it the u the us has lost its major competitive advantage which is a, we're a continent we should be a continental size regulatory and economic space but we're not but you know that, that's just a small version of the whole world you you're right. I mean, you know, a company that the idea that you have a company formed in the U.S. and you have to like qualify in Malta and deal with different sets of law and tax is it's, it's insane, and it doesn't you know it doesn't it doesn't to Wolf's point it, it reflects the way the world was 300 years ago. It's not the way things are now. So I like I like your vision. I, I I don't know how quickly jurisdictions are going to accept this alternative form. But I think part of the mission of the DevDAO, as I understand it, is to, you know, not not be abandoned organization, but to work with regulators to check the boxes, to be in communication, and for to your point, you know, to bring them along in the language they understand, so that there's a natural bridge to allowing what should happen to happen. And you know, I I, I applaud you for engaging with this. Um, so let me just just because of the time, let me let me switch gears a little bit. I, I want to take the time that's left and sort of deep dive Wolf's medium article, academic work, and the governance structure of the DevDAO. Um, first thing, I, I'm sort of a constitutional law groupie, and I've had to several times during this project, I've had to unwind my brain to kind of actually hear what he's saying and not reinsert it into my existing framework. And so rather than me putting words in his mouth, well, can you talk for a few minutes about how you see governance, how you see re reputation, how you see the ways to resist sock puppets and bandwagoning and, and all the traditional problems that come with coordinating 
a flat non hierarchical non hierarchical organization yeah uh, thank you Gordon. so uh, what you're describing if I, uh, of unwinding one's brain this is an iterative process that i had to go through some you know eight eight years ago or so and that i find myself having to go through over and over again and we in the dev DAO, we find ourselves in this process continuously right so because there's always the temptation to centralize things to simplify it and move away from the from the truly decentralized vision that the fluidity that that is needed in the governance right so um any system you create is only as good as it is attack resistant i think that that was a premise that i got stuck with for me for years where i I didn't want to build something that I knew could be disrupted a year or two later, or when it reaches uh, scaling stages, right? Because that's when people come in and try to disrupt it if they can, right? So I, I wasn't even going to, I was going to drop the ball if I found somebody who says, I can sock puppet attack you, you're done. And so the system was out. And then I kept saying to people in my network, critique it, just, just, poke holes in it because I'm done if you can. And nobody could. And I'm still waiting for somebody to come in and say, Wolf, you're screwed <laughs> because I can attack you. Now you can build a system <clears throat> and run it for five years successfully. And then somebody will try and attack it. And you, you will have a problem if that happens, right? So the, the, one of the premises is, and guys, there's no guarantees that it's not possible, right? But a, a fun, foundational aspect of building something to me has to be system designs that, that are built on this idea of uh, sock puppet attack resistance, 51% attack resistance, tyranny of the majority of resistance, et cetera, et cetera. As a, there's, there's about, um, uh, lifeless faults, all these things. There's about 15 attack vectors that I have in one paper. And once I went through it, and once I understood the math and the, the delicate balance of math, uh, once I, I got there and nobody could attack it, then I started saying, okay, well, this, this is real. And I didn't trust it quite, quite to be quite upfront. I, I didn't, I doubted myself for a really long time. Then I started uh, working with Craig, uh, Craig Calcaterra is a mathematician who spent 20 years of his life developing his own system and dynamical systems and mathematics. And Craig really got me to the point where I, I trusted myself even more. I knew that, 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 you had, that it was possible, I thought it was possible, but I didn't trust myself. And then working with Craig, really, that was, that was really, really important for me. So that, that's a five year or so collaboration. We're writing a book right now on what we believe is, can be accomplished with these systems. And um, so, yeah, so that's, that's, that was sort of a basic premise of, of uh, trying to decentralize DAO governance, right? And then if, if that's possible, if you can truly decentralize DAO governance, I don't want to sound grandiose, but I, I, I still fail to see the limitations of what you can do with this in terms of uh, decentralized infrastructure building. Um, we haven't discussed this internally. Again, these are my own views. These are not DevDAO views. But um, if you think about automating this governance system, the oracles that come out of it, but the automation alone, so teaching machines to reputation stake, there are there are, there are applications in there that we cannot even grasp right now, right? Um, in terms of what is possible here, um, the the oracle functionality is something that is that that I personally find extremely interesting. So I teach coding for lawyers, <clears throat> and when I teach coding, it's very simplistic uh, solidity coding. So I'm not a, a deep dive coder like Timothy is, right? That's that's not me. I'm not a Rust person. But I, you know, so when you teach it, you start realizing or it's all about the oracles, right? Because if you can create chains of blockchains that are all verified, you always end up in a smart contract at the end with an oracle function that 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 can tear this, the whole thing down from a decentralization perspective, right? <clears throat> so how do you create a truly decentralized oracle to not disrupt the blockchain purity, quote unquote, if that exists, right? If you get reputation staking governance right, this delicate balance that, that exists, 
to me, those validation pools, the internal governance uh, of the of the DevDAO, can also function in the long run as oracles. Now, again, these are my own views. This is not hasn't been discussed internally, hasn't been built, right? This is just theory. So I apologize, uh, Timothy, if I should back off on this, uh, you, you, you tell me, you know, I mean, this is sort of... Well, oh, actually, I put it in the agenda discussion of your work and it, it's a distinct, it's a related but separate topic from DevDAO. So we, we want to, I'm saying we want to know. <laughs> so please. Yeah, okay, so ask and, me and, and everyone understands that it, it's separate. Go ahead, please. Um, so, okay, let me, and I, we've done this in the past, so um, with, with Timothy, so I, I wanna talk a little bit about decentralized infrastructure building, which I think we, everybody on this call recognizes that what we currently have with third generation blockchains, that's great, scaling is all needed, but you can't scale in the long run without governance, right? So somebody has to build decentralized um, governance systems that are dynamical in autonomous and decentralized uh, anonymous systems. So when we talk about decentralized infrastructure building, I like, I like this analogy and maybe some people think it's corny, but I like it, so I'll say it. Um, this idea of, if I wanna build a decentralized bridge a de decentralized airport, so talk about infrastructure products, right? Um, the telegram, the railway, what do I need? I need some basic form of trans means of transportation. Let's call it a gravel road, right? So if you want to build a bridge, you need to bring materials to the, to the river to build the bridge across the river, which then connects people and continents, etc. right? So what is that gravel road? Well, it, you, some people may say, well, it's a truly, um, it's, a, it's a truly decentralized public blockchain. Do we have that? Well, I have some doubts, okay? Now, are we building that? No, we're not. But governance is, falls in the same category, right? So if, without governance, you cannot evolve decentralized systems. And what drove me nuts several years ago is this, 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 the fact of the matter is, if you build one decentralized infrastructure product, it cannot exist in the ecosystem unless you build five others around it. It can't, it will falter, it will fail, it will collapse. You need to build I, I, all I'm these sorry, things well, at the well, same time. Can you, can, you, can you explain that point? That was, that was interesting, but I don't know if I got it. Can you just okay, so into that one? If, if I want to, uh, if, I have an, if I invented electricity for argument's sake, right? How do I get the electricity to the people so they can, they can move away from the, the, the fire and the lamps in the house, right? The fire lamp in the house. Mm -hmm. So what I need, I need a generator, I need the wiring, I need the, um, uh, the infrastructure products to get the, the wiring to the house, et cetera, et cetera, right? And in decentralized system, I think it's, it's, it's similar. How do you get granny to use a cryptocurrency to buy her banana? Well, and this was very controversial in the community, right? Oh, no, no, the markets will take care of it. It will stabilize itself. Yeah, that was four years ago. I got into shouting matches with people over this. You are anti-crypto. And, and I said, no, I'm not anti-crypto. I, I want the same thing you want, but I, I'm realist. You know, Timothy is more realist than I am. Uh, um, you need to, and then everybody starts talking about um, stable coins, right? That was a bad word three years ago. It was people thought you were nuts. You are, you are against the system. Now everybody starts realizing, okay, well, that's what we need, right? There's no way around these, these things because you have to get a stable currency into people's uh, uh, pockets, wallets, in order for them to actually be, become involved in mainstream transactions. You know, granny buying a banana. Granny is never going to make a calculation. Is this a good investment if I move away from Bitcoin because it may bounce up uh, uh, you know, 50 uh, percentage points uh, while I make my purchase, right? It's never gonna, it's never gonna work, right? So it's, sorry, I'm oversimplifying this a little bit here, but so you need certain products, certain infrastructure products, right? And we can talk about what those are. I, I personally think there are four central ones that I can see. And I get, as I said, I got motivated mostly by this idea of distributed jurisdiction, right? So how do we initially, and then I started realizing if we create a truly workable arbitration system for smart contracts, as smart contracts become more global, more, more um, commonly accepted, 
it has to be decentralized. You can't use the courts, right? The courts will, it will take years and they will pull you back. They won't interpret code. They, will, they want uh, natural language, right? So how, how we can't translate all code into natural language. It's never gonna happen, right? So there has to be some, something else. So that, that was this idea of, uh, that, that was the article I mentioned earlier um, that was published by the ABA on uh, distributed jurisdiction. You have to find some instrument, some mechanism, legal me mechanism to give decentralized solutions, decentralized legal certainty. And with decentralized legal certainty, you can build markets, right? So, and I'm still believing that it's all about market building. So you cannot build markets unless you have infrastructure. With infrastructure and legal certainty, among other products, you, cr you create um, the certainty that's needed to for mainstream adoption, with mainstream adoption, um, you build markets because investors keep buying in because they know they have remedies in decentralized systems, et cetera, et cetera. So there's another element, for instance, a paper I wrote several years ago on decentralized underwriting. Somebody has to take the risk if things go wrong. You, you can one say, yes, I have a legal solution. I'm giving you legal certainty, which doesn't exist right now. But even if you created that, hypothetically speaking, you still need somebody to take the risk if things go wrong. So let's call it decentralized insurance. Lloyd's is not going to underwrite your contract. Now that insurance companies, they're talking about it. They know they can make an enormous amount, centralized insurance companies, they can make an enormous amount of money if they get into this market as it proliferates. At the same time, imagine a DAO construct allowing a decentralized form of underwriting where the people can get the, the premiums, not the insurance companies. The people share the premiums of underwriting proportionally. So we talk a lot about governance internally and proportional payouts and the way this would work in the dev down. That product, talk about the vision and infrastructure building in future. You can, if, if it works internally and we haven't proven that it works, we don't have the uh, descriptive statistics um, for how it works internally in the dev down, right? It's all experimentation right now. But I want you to think about what that means if you can pass this on to the people and, and give it to them as a, as, as, a, as a way to receive the premiums that currently Lloyd's and other insurance companies would be collecting on, on smart contracts, right? But you need the deft out for that product, right? You need, you need the deft out uh, reputation staking engine, all the things, if it works. Again, we haven't proven it works, right? Um, you need all these products to, to, to have some under, underlying um, infrastructure product, and that is governance. Yeah. So you can build these products, and I, I show it with math in papers that, that is math, mathematically, hypothetically, from an incentive, uh, incentivization perspective, is possible. But you have to prove the underlying tech exists, right? And we don't have the underlying tech. So the dev now is at a point now where we have we have a, a really powerful team and we have sufficient insight into what is needed in, and that's a consensus that I didn't create that was in the DevDAO before, I believe, that you need to build a decentralized infrastructure, right? And so those, that's a critical, that's critical mass to me where you, where you have these, the recognition of what is needed and you have the people who recognize what is needed and you have the experimentation with the technology. So I'll, I'll stop here, but that, that's to me, that, that combination is where the power comes from increasingly. It's fascinating. Now, give us the, give us the, the I, you, you just covered a whole bunch of material. Give, give us the short version of how reputation plays into this specifically. And so, the staking and even even lever, even leveraging off how perhaps the dev DAO is going to apply your principles in its context. Okay, so and, and hopefully I didn't miss it when you just said it, but it, you know, it, just from the point of view of a participant in the dev DAO, I, I'm I signed up, I'm a member. What happened? Okay, let me let me uh, preface this what I'm saying now by telling you that three years ago, I moved away from using the word reputation altogether. In Silicon Valley, when you used the word reputation, there were several people who tried it. You, you couldn't go anywhere 
Okay, the people were focused on on technological solutions. They weren't interested in this next level, this nebulous, weird concept of what is that reputation, right? And it's still unclear. So uh, the IEEE P twenty one forty forty five group has now, for the first time, recognized the reputation uh, governance group as a subgroup, right? It mm -hmm. took four years for people to realize we can't build decentralized infrastructure without reputation solution. We still get into pissing matches, no names here, um, about you know, people thinking that it's evil and you know, there's, because they don't understand the vision. So there's all, all kinds of arguments still. Um, so that's, that's, I just want to say this from the get-go. Now, having said that, I'm of the opinion that there's no way around reputation systems for decentralized infrastructure building. So what is reputation, one might ask? Um, and what is identity that is tied to reputation? Are these two separate concepts? Do we have to define them separately? Um, I've written on this, but for purposes of reputation engines, I think it's, it's, it's important to, to understand why reputation is, 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 a, is a core functionality. It, count, it flows from one, this idea of using something that is non-fungible. It is not a currency that I can put on an exchange and start making money off, right? It's, so it's an NFT, but it's, it's an NFT that uses a different perspective on, on governance and crypto economic systems. So with reputation comes this basic insight that you have to build something organically, something that is valuable to people that they can't immediately sell, right? There's second, second order economic effects that, that, that apply. So first order would be, hey, give me a fungible token, I'll sell it, I'll make money, boom, right? This is, I'm sorry to say, but that's really what the ecosystem still is extremely influenced by, right? And, and people build systems because they expect a big bang getting these tokens, things go up, things collapse, oh, but I make my, made money now and jump to the next system, okay? So I, unfortunately that was the reality for many, many years. So reputation doesn't work that way. Reputation, as I said, has to be built organically. It has to be something that you care deeply about, right? So, you know, the happiness, uh, happiness in life is if to really care deeply and at the same time not care at all, right? Okay, so let, let me <laughs> transition this a little bit. Um, so, reputation here is you, you don't want to, even if you don't understand what a reputation token means, right, and how it works, reputation is something that's intangible. Reputation is something that is non-fungible. Reputation is something that you care about deeply because you expect it to generate results at a minimum, not necessarily financial results, but results in the future, right? And this is how the entire financial system works, right? Why do you hire Goldman Sachs? Well, you hire Goldman Sachs because you want the reputation bang of Goldman Sachs. And what does Goldman Sachs do? Well, Goldman Sachs protects its reputation um, at all costs because they know that that's what makes them, generates fees and that's what generates the, the, the interest from clients, right? So can you build reputation yourself as an individual? Disintermediation, now the word disintermediation was abused in the crypto community for years now. Uh, everything was disintermediated, right? So, uh, but, but how, how does reputation, personal reputation disintermediate from um, reputation that's built by intermediaries for whom you have to pay fees, right? Can I, can I build my own reputation? Yes, you can. So, but how, how, how would this reputation be used? And they're, they're, I apologize, Gordon, if I'm going on a tangent here. There's so many little This is layers. exactly what I wanted to spend. Okay the remainder uh, of the webinar on, so keep going. Okay, so how do I build reputation in a way that I can actually myself utilize the reputation? Well, you might do something in a DAO and in, the, in, in this DAO, you, 
you may prove yourself, your merit, your, your unique human skill set, yeah, that cannot be quantified right now. You, you, you can f send a resume to somebody that is deeply flawed, but now people have to figure out uh, ways to dissect your resume and figure out if you messed up somewhere in, this, in, the, in the centralized structure, or they use references from other people to verify that you are truly as good as you say on your resume, right? Now imagine you could give somebody your reputation in something and, and that person would know the way that reputation was built, it's quantifiable. It was organically built, it was built over time, it couldn't be disrupted, it couldn't be faked. So we talk about civil attack resistance, right? Sock puppet attack resistance. We don't have that right now. So if you get into a car with an Uber driver who has a 5.0, we all know that person could have hired um, his, I'm making up an example now, there are many different systems, right? Driver has 5.0 reputation rating. That person could have been really bad at driving, but have hired his buddies for half a year Every you know every third a ride, and um, the, the, his buddies he pays his buddies ten bucks. His buddies give him very high ranking, so he can keep up his ranking. Now some people say, oh, that's not possible, and you know I don't want to get into it. There's all kinds of ways to scam these existing systems, right? Now what the reputation systems that I'm talking about is again organically grown and reflecting a unique skill set. So there there are different kinds of DAOs that over time will will uh, proliferate with different kinds of themes and different kinds of reputation that signal value, yeah? And these different, so, you know, Timothy may be a top-notch top, top -notch Rust developer. So he's on the, on the, on the Rust developer uh, DAO and he creates templates that other people keep using. Well, that creates a long-term uh, reputation. Now, right now we know Timothy, we know who he is, we know his reputation, we know his, his background, we know his social media. Um, and all that influences our, our way of assessing Timothy's reputation. In some ways it's good, in some ways it's really bad. Now imagine we didn't know Timothy at all. All we know is that this reputation score and the way that a reputation score was built is truly decentralized, cannot be corrupted, and is organically grown over time and is non-fungible attack and attack resistance. And we know how hard it is to build that reputation score. Now, if I don't know Timothy at all, and I see that reputation score in a certain DAO, over time, I can, I will be able to say, I trust this. So this is part of the vision, if you want, right? If this system truly works, I can trust that score. Now, Timothy can make the score available. Or he cannot make it available, right? In truly anonymous, decentralized autonomous system. Now, we're not nowhere near that, Gordon. I want to be very clear about this. We are nowhere near any of this, right? We are just starting to experiment with how can these systems, these sc the scoring of reputation systems, uh, how can that actually work, right? Um, so, yeah, I, if you want to ask more questions, uh, I'll be happy to be more specific about some of this. Um, and again, I don't want to say that that's what the DevDAO does right now. Uh, all we do at this point is we're experimenting with reputation metrics uh, for scoring. We're experimenting with uh, reputation building. We're experimenting with uh, reputation salary. So second order economic effects, right? We, it's, it's a non-fungible NFT. Uh, but somehow you have to incentivize people. So we're experimenting with uh, designs um, that that pay people um, uh, fungible reputation salaries for building non-fungible reputation, right? And that's key right now. And that's, to me, that's, that's the future. That's what the decentralized infrastructure needs. Um, and the systems that if this works, which I believe it does, the math suggests that it does, if you build it truly decentralized, right? The systems that we can build on top we cannot even we cannot even understand right now what you can build on top of that. I'll end here. Thanks for listening. I know that Gordon has muted himself, <laughs> so I just he cannot message. unmute himself. <laughs> okay, there, no, 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 there, no, there, there you go. go. Oh, there I, you go. I, I, was, I was I was like screaming in an empty room. Like, <laughs> unmute me. So I, I I think what Wolf was saying is fascinating, and I I think I'm taking the first steps and wrapping my head around it. I. 
you know, nor normally, you know, I, I feel bad for having, that we couldn't sit for hours and do it. it it's actually very interesting. And I think it probably warrants a, fo a follow-up show, show. So, well, thank you. That was- Thank you for letting me ramble on. No, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, so we're, we're coming up on the end of the show. Um, I think here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pass it to Sander so he can say a few words and give his impressions. And then uh, we're gonna wrap up with Tim. I'd love to, after Sander speaks, I'd love for you to tell the audience you know, I'm sure they're interested in getting involved or making inquiries about DevDAO. You know, how do they reach you? Where do they get in touch? You know, where, where's this going? Like, how do they make the connection? Yeah. Um, I'll also point out that, well, we're gonna publish this on YouTube. I'll include links to the, the presentation deck for DevDAO, to Wolf's article and some other materials. And you can Google Wolf and see a whole bunch of good stuff. So Sander, I'm gonna wrap up. I'm gonna pass it to you. And then when you're all set, pass it to Tim and I'd say it was a good morning, but go ahead. Cool. So first of all, also on uh, on behalf of uh, Iconic and the team that has powered this uh, this Wednesday Crypto Wednesday uh, show, I would like to really show my appreciation to to Bernd, to Wolf, and to Tim, and also to you, Gordon, for being here. I appreciate everybody taking some time of their personal agenda to share something where where we are all excited about. So I'm very grateful on that. Uh, and to our audience, so everybody that's listening now online, everybody that's listening to the recording or viewing the recording, we will post this on our uh, channels. So one of them will be the YouTube channel, of course. And underneath, we will place the links to download all the PDFs from the docs and from the article on Medium um, that, is, that is available. And if you have any other uh, questions or feedback or something that you want to share with the group, you can contact us. Um, I think one of the, the, the best channels is to contact us on, on LinkedIn. You can find us on, uh, on LinkedIn and uh, please connect with us. This is a good, good way. But also if you want to send an email, you can send it to our general email address, which is info at iconic.org. We will also place it underneath all the things we will put out. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, maybe I hand over back to you, Gordon, for a final note, and then we close today's Crypto Wednesday show. Uh, my final note is going to be to racket it back to Tim. And Tim, it's I fascinating. Have. People want to get involved. I want to get involved. You know, how do people get involved and reach yeah. you and understand? Thanks, Gordon. You know, thanks for having us. I um, mean, you know, we really have been kind of uh, quietly just working on this, um, you know, and, and, and hand selecting people. We're, we're going to be very you know, much more public about this one as we start building out some of the infrastructure to have better communications. Uh, and really define our membership process uh, and, the, and the personas that we are looking for and interested in, 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 in collaborating with. Uh, for now, Telegram, uh, if you're on the Telegram, uh, look for Developers DAO, at Developers DAO is, is the channel name. Uh, on the internet, um, I'm sure I can be find, found, whether uh, or not I'll respond is, is always a question. I will try to get, to get back and respond, but uh, there's a lot of us involved right now. Um, my personal uh, telegram is Trust Layer, uh, T R U S T L A Y E R, and I, and I try to try to respond there. But um, you know, it's 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 one grand experiment um, uh, on a continuation of many experiments uh, to, to get us this far forth in, in humanity, and, um, and we're just trying to move uh, onwards together a, a pace. Uh, and hopefully, uh, those that are interested in the mission of uh, more meritocracy toward flat organizational structures and ideally the evolution of, of frameworks in, in both a legal and technical um, representation uh, can come by and, and help us. We don't have we don't have all the answers. We're trying to uh, we're, we're trying to uh, we're trying to be creative and we're trying to get things done. Um, so it's been a very um, amazing conversation. All the week's conversations that we do have um, they're they're fantastic. And so we try to involve those that. We all admire, I and mean, then we're trying to bring people on uh, that have varied, uh, varied talents and, and varied expertise uh, to to where we can round out the team and, and make it better. And the eventual goal is that this is a, a very, very large organization, um, and it's very, very open. Um, but you know, as we are uh, moving slowly, um, you know, we try to make sure that we have the right pieces and, and the people. That, that fit those right spaces. So um, hopefully we'll have a, an out, outwards web facing uh, information depot at some point soon. Uh, I expect that to happen. Uh, and we're probably going to do a little bit of PR based around some of the work that's being released, including uh, Wolf's academic paper 
uh, we'll continue to, to do publishings uh, through not only Wolf's Medium, but, but other associated uh, medium accounts, I think, to get information out. Um, but yeah, we, we, we love doing what we do, and uh, we're just trying to have a better impact on the world. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Wolf. Thanks, Bern. Um, Sander, Thanks, my buddy, good job, all you people. Um, have a wonderful Wednesday. As we say in the U.S., happy hump day. And see you next week. Thank you.